Um, my name is Argenis, and today I'm going to be presenting this work that I've developed uh, with Hans at Lancaster University about new ways to um, play using um, eye tracking technologies. So, obviously, I'm going to talk about gaze interaction, and as you can see, um, how it's been. Um, um, used now. For example, in Assassin's Creed, uh, the player could just look at the um, objects that they want to interact with um, to collect them. We have other examples, um, like in the Tomb Raider, in which the player could automatically um, aim the gun towards the um, enemies that they want to shoot. These two examples show how gaze has been embraced uh, till now using this interaction metaphor of what you look at is um, what you get. This provides um, um, more accessible um, gameplay, um, augmented performance of the, um, of, of the controller, and even um, enhanced um, immersion. However, in my research and also throughout my PhD, what I'm investigating is, uh, what I'm exploring is how can we play with gaze differently, creating more challenging experiences, and investigating which new uh, uh, metaphors could we use away from the one that is um, currently used. So um, today I'm presenting this game called Twilight. There is a collection of three mini games that um, um, are played using the keyboard for navigation and gaze interaction. So the three games pose um, collection tasks that need to be solved quickly and dealing with external events um, that are affecting um, the puzzle solving, such as attacks from um, other characters. So in these games, what we wanted to introduce were um, challenging dynamics. So it was um, um, really hard to play with gays. And by doing that, uh, we introduced um, bigger rules and, and intuitive um, interactions to create a sort of tension and, and check how that could open up um, the space for gays interaction and create new metaphors. So in order to explain each game individually, I'm going to describe them using the themes that we report in the paper. And um, that those are the themes. But um, if you want to know more about the thematic analysis or the rigor of the uh, study, you can read the paper. And today I'm just going to use them um, to introduce, I'm just going to use three of them to introduce the three different games and tell you about what we um, learned about um, the players using uh, playing the games. So the first one relates to visual dilemmas and the fact that during the game, the players needed more time um, um, to adapt to the, to the um, um, dynamics, but also they were balancing where they were looking and how long were they looking um, in, in specific locations of the game. To better understand this concept, I'm going to show you here the uh, witches game in which the player controls this witch that needs to be collecting, um, recruiting um, the other witches so to save the capture um, fellow. While the player is solving that, you can see that there's going to be some attacks from villagers that they can, um, want to burn the witch and the player, by looking at them and tapping a key, they can cast a water spell to um, repel them. But the game has a twist, and is that because magic comes with a price and looks draw attention, whatever the player is looking, there's one villager that is always going to go there, and it's going to kill um, any character that finds in the way, as you can see here. It's a little bit brutal. Um, so uh, what this poses is a challenge because... Um, Intuitively, we will look at the place where we want to go, but because we have this um, spoiling of the player intentions, the players had to adapt on how they could solve the puzzle. So to do that, what we saw that they were doing in order to succeed is to uh, avoid looking where they wanted to go. And they um, adopted this strategy of looking at one of the corners of the screen to keep the um, enemy away. Um, and then, um, therefore, uh, we assume that they were relying on what they were seeing in their peripheral vision and switching between focal vision, um, um, actively using focal vision on peripheral vision when they had to attack the um, villagers that were carrying the flames. 
So this effect makes us um, reflect on the importance of designing with the whole potential, but by thinking uh, on the whole potential of gaze in mind, and is very in line with um, uh, my research and previous research that I've that I've um, that I've published that explores gaze as not just the place where we look, but also could consider where uh, we are not looking or what happens when we are not looking, um, when we are avoiding to look, or we have when we have to deal with different um, um, events that happen at once, or uh, playing with different levels of visual attention, such as relying on peripheral vision. So with this as a um, little takeaway, we encourage game designers that want to implement games with games to think about these possibilities and not limit yourselves to think about where you look, but also this whole spectrum of what could happen when, um, um, how can you use the design for things that happen when you uh, are not looking. The next theme is called metaphors, and this comes from the fact that through my um, design like research practice, I always um, I consistently use um, uh, narratives and metaphors of gaze to explain those challenges that I introduce in the games. So in in the case of Twilight, they were like really um, very challenging um, dynamics. So I use those cultural I use cultural metaphors to explain why those dynamics apply. So in the case of the witches game, um, as I told you before, there's uh, looks that draw attention and that magic comes with a price, and I use that to um, kind of support that there's a spoiling of the intention of the player. If we look at other cultural references, we have a game based on the picture of Dorian Gray, in which the player controls um, Dorian and needs to collect pieces of the frame. But Dorian is so narcissistic that you need to look at him to make him move. And when the player moves the character, everybody moves at the same time. What happens here is that the challenge is that the field of view is limited and we're forcing, we're imposing this rule of looking at Dorian. So what happens is like if you have a notice is that other characters pick the frames and that's a danger. So to solve that, the players, to solve this puzzle, um, the player that is controlling Dorian is Dorian, could look at other characters to intimidate them so they will not move. And then you could um, arrange um, this the, the characters in this puzzle so you could safely collect the frames. But why is this helpful for? So um, the players could use the smooth movement of the NPC characters to stop, for example, the attacks of the assassin the wants to kill Dorian. Then we have other kinds of metaphors, uh, like in the third game, that are, uh, for example, looking through um, someone else's eyes. So in this game, it's based on the uh, strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and the context of the game, the two characters manage to separate, and they need to collect those bottles to keep it this way. What we introduce here is something very challenging, and it's going to be difficult to understand, is that Hyde are connected, and Hyde moves through Jekyll's eyes. What this means is that Hyde will move towards the point that the player being Jekyll is looking at, creating this bias mapping and making, um, I, uh, I need to be honest, the game really, really difficult. So then the challenge was in order to succeed, the, play, the player needs to understand um, this mapping and, and, and solve the puzzle. So with this as a little takeaway of this, is this theme, we see the potential of using those cultural um, references and um, metaphors of gaze that we all know that are there in fictions, they're in, in pop culture, and um, think about them as a tool for design because um, when we think about gaze, gaze has a meaning, it could be cultural, it could be behavioral, and we have a lot of reference that could help us creating these new uh, mechanics of, um, for gaze interaction in games. Lastly, uh, I want to introduce this um, theme that I called Gaze Identity. Uh, spoiler alert, this is uh, a little bit meta, so um, bear with me for a bit. Uh, so this uh, theme um, talks about uh, that when, where the players were looking at, that was representing the character that they were controlling, and also the role that they were assuming in the game. So we saw, for example, in Dorian's game, when the player was looking at Dorian, it was the player who was looking at Dorian. However, when the player was looking at the other NPC, uh, at the other char characters, it was Dorian who was intimidating them, assuming this kind of double role of who is the player when they're using gaze. Similarly, in Jekyll and Hyde, that's more clear because uh, both characters are connecting, connected, so you don't really know who of them you are controlling. 
And in the witches game, what we found out from uh, the uh, analysis of the uh, observing the players play and the, and the um, comments was that uh, most of them, like 90% of the participants reported that they were using the um, villager as their minion and they felt that they were controlling um, um, that character. This was completely unintentionally. We didn't want to do that. But they felt how they were controlling the powers of the witch and at the same time the um, um, villager in, in these situations. What this made us reflect on is how Gaze has this potential of maybe allowing the players to interact or to control characters that before it was impossible, such as NPCs or like it's the, in, in Dorian's case, companions like in Jekyll and Hyde or the enemies in the witches' games. So just to finish my presentation, um, I want to invite you to read the paper and find out more about the other themes. And I'll leave you with three takeaways. That is, uh, there are more um, to gaze interaction than what we're looking at. The use of metaphors opens up the opportunity to, to explore the design space of, of gaze and support um, um, challenging interactions. And finally, gaze opens up this space to maybe control other characters in the game. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, some questions. I did felt a little bit like the second character from Dorian Gray because he wouldn't look at me. It's like. <laughs> Anyone else? So, we can all bring up a question. So, what's next? Um, writing on my thesis. <laughs> Um, so, uh, if any of you is interested, the, after the session, I'm presenting a poster that summarizes uh, more or less my whole PhD, so I can, um, I can talk about that. And I'm basically exploring um, these uh, new metaphors on what, what new techniques can we use to implement um, gazing games that have these more challenging characteristics and are different to the um, current use metaphor. Hi, I'm oh, sorry, Regan Magic University of Saskatchewan. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on why we should use gaze in games. I have a lot of students who always want to look at gaze interaction in games, and I just because we sh we can doesn't necessarily mean we should. And they've never managed to convince me that I, that it's a really good idea. So I would love to hear someone who's chosen to do this as a research topic. Um, why why do you think that this is really a like what benefits does gaze interaction have over and above using some other type of input um, to do the same type of interaction in a game? Uh, that's a really good question, thank you. Um, I feel that right now, maybe Gaze doesn't have that, is not that powerful for the gaming industry. Like I know that, that Toby, the uh, main uh, manufacturer of eye trackers, are trying to push it um, for game design and now for um, esports. Um, but where my research comes from is more or less this problem that if I were to use any of the um, commercial games that are published now and I remove the eye tracker, I can still um, play the game. So why would I spend 100 euros on an eye tracker to play games? So that's why my research started. Like I wanted to find ways that if you remove the eye tracker, for example, in Twilight, you cannot play the game because you cannot give the attention to Dorian, you cannot move um, Jekyll and Hyde. So for me, um, obviously those are mini games. For me, the future of um, um, eye tracking in gaming maybe is more tied to VR experiences because I know that people are pushing um, hard on that and I know them uh, for desktop games or, um, or, or consoles, we have uh, a lot of work to do because we need to find the recipes or like the frameworks to give uh, gamers the experience that really relies or requires the, the use of an eye, of an eye tracker. Um, <clears throat> Stefan Kreuter, Deakin University. Um, playing a game with your peripheral vision seems to be, or I guess it would feel very strenuous, um, but I don't know. Uh, do you have from your experiences testing it yourself and or with others, can you tell us a little bit more about how that what was perceived? 
Yeah, so um, to talk about that, I need to refer to a paper that we published this year in Kite that it's um, um, called Supervision. And um, in that paper, we... Um, so Supervision is a game that um, is designed thinking about um, only using peripheral... Uh, forcing the player to use um, peripheral vision to play. Um, we had sessions that... Uh, from the top of my head, I think it was like 20 minutes or like between 20 and 30 minutes playing. And um, of course, the player was feeling um, tired, but we cannot assume that that was for using peripheral vision of our eye tracking because they were in front of a screen. The, like there's, there's a lot of factors that we, don't, we are not sure that was really uh, for peripheral vision. Again, that game was a short experience. So uh, how to implement those kind of things in a longer game, I've, I... This is just an hypothesis, but I could imagine a game in which you are pretending to be a spy, and then you need to you have a partner, and you need to like oh, um, hang around, um, make it seem that you don't know each other, and then you need to walk and be receiving those cues from peripheral vision that are abilities that you have um, innate. Um, it's an interesting question, and it's like we don't really have the. Um, um, data to, to say, the evidence to say that that was tiring. What we found out is that people were um, improving in the de detection of visual cues in peripheral vision after playing the games. Yeah, thank you. So my short talk, so rapid...